Credits. Um, so our next presenter is Phil Brown. Uh, Phil uh, works with, uh, with nest monitoring and tagging of Monadnock region broadwing hawks. Um, Phil has been fascinated with birds from an early age. During and after undergraduate studies at Rutgers University, he pursued a career in natural resource management, initially in urban settings. In 2004, he moved to New Hampshire, where he managed wildlife sanctuaries for New Hampshire Audubon for 17 years, ultimately rising to the position of director of land management. In 2006, he moved to the Monadnock region to study conservation biology at Antioch University, New England, while continuing to work for New Hampshire Audubon. Soon afterward, he added the role of PAC Monadnock Raptor Adver Observatory Coordinator to his job responsibilities, work he still does as the Harris Center's Director of Bird Conservation. His current role as Bird Conservation Director and Land Specialist at the Harris Center has expanded to include other birds, especially raptors, monitoring projects, community education programming, and land stewardship. He also leads birding and nature tours for a variety of organizations. Um, thanks, Phil. Okay, thank you so much, Matt. Can everybody hear me okay? How about now? Good. All right. All right. Well, I'm thrilled to speak with you all today about a project that is um, one that's been a big part of my last two summers at the Harris Center, uh, the nest monitoring and tagging of Monadnock Region's broad-winged hawks. First, a little bit about broad-winged hawks. Uh, these are medium-sized buteos. Buteo is a genus of raptors and a very common breeding raptor of the Monadnock region. Um, they also breed in largely parts of the Northeast US and Southern parts of Canada, all the way west to Alberta. Um, these birds are complete migrants, meaning they leave their entire breeding range every fall. They vacate from Canada and the US and head out um, and spend the winter in places from Southern Mexico to Bolivia, more or less, in a lot of South American countries, and also in uh, Central America. Uh, the core of the winter population is thought to be in northern parts of South America. Um, but despite what we do know about these birds, there's still a lot that we don't know about them. And, um, and some of that is just being discovered now through this project. Um, so broadwings each year make this spectacular fall migration uh, that a lot of us are familiar with. Um, they go along the ridge lines of the Appalachian Mountains and along the Gulf Coast of Mexico, through Mexico and into Central America, and then they pass through into uh, and disperse in parts of South America. They're a little bit uh, less conspicuous then. Uh, and they're really widely celebrated at hawk migration monitoring sites, including Pacman Adnock Raptor Observatory, the Harris Center's own hawk watch here in Peterborough, New Hampshire. And during mid-September each year, these hawks will gather up in really huge numbers, sometimes by the hundreds or even thousands, and they form these massive kettles uh, or flocks and ride thermals all the way uh, down through their, their migration range. Um, they vacate the breeding grounds, and um, they really compound the spectacle compounds in Mexico and Central America, where upwards of 1.5 million of these raptors may be migrating together in just a period of a few weeks. It's really an amazing thing to see. Uh, I was in Mexico about a month ago watching the migration. We counted 75,000 broad-winged hawks in one hour alone, just all over the sky. The numbers at Pacman Adnock, which are graphed here, are a, a little less uh, exciting, but still our most numerous migratory species in the Northeast. <clears throat> So in 2021, the Harris Center officially partnered with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Pennsylvania and uh, ex helped expand the organization's research into broad-winged hawks, uh, which they've been conducting since 2014. Um, since that year, uh, scientists and, and community scientists alike from Hawk Mountain had been conducting research on the species uh, breeding range, uh, their migration, routes and uh, through the use of transmitters, looking at the migration routes and wintering areas, which was um, brand new research at that point that was being conducted with, um, with uh, Alberta as well. Um, so the long-term research uh, presumably will help us identify a different population, looking at the New England population of broadwings compared to what was already known uh, of the uh, Pennsylvania population, which was studied before. And uh, that could help identify 
potential conservation strategies that would be necessary to conserve the entire species or at least components of that, uh, that population. And there are threats, even though the, the broad-winged hawk is not an endangered species, it's not imperiled in any way uh, globally or federally, um, but there have been declines. And uh, 15 of the, of the hawk watches in the eastern part of the U.S. have documented declines over the last 10 years. Um, also, 13 U.S. states, eastern states, have listed them as threatened. And um, largely, this is probably due to deforestation, loss of forested habitat. At least that's the, the current working theory. Um, also, in their wintering range, um, deforestation is a major issue. Think of these birds going to parts of South America, where deforestation is, uh, is a common threat there. Brazil having issues with forest fires and lots of clearing for agriculture uh, is definitely limiting their ability to find shelter once they do hit their wintering range. Also in the migration, there are some potential issues with stopover sites. Um, so probably lack of uh, opportunities uh, to find shelter. Um, there are still other threats that are limiting some of these raptors, such as direct impacts like shooting, which still does occur in parts of Central and South America, um, and uh, the illegal um, wildlife trade, and also just shooting for food. Um, they're also vulnerable to collisions and, um, and uh, potential climate change impacts. So enter New Hampshire, uh, the second most forested state in the U.S., and the super sanctuary, the Harris Center's 25,000 acre conserved uh, land in, uh, in the Monadnock region, centered around the headquarters in Hancock. Uh, this is an eight town area. Um, there are uh, several attributes here that you'll see up on the board here, 23 peaks over 1,500 feet. So large diversity of forests, high elevation summits, uh, ponds and lakes, a variety of different wetland types. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty wooded area if you know the Monadnock region. And um, that's the very first challenge that we faced as researchers trying to find broad-winged hawk nests. It's a very wooded area. These birds like to nest in the woods. Um, it's a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack. So we had to overcome that, that very challenge right from the start. Um, so regional observations of broad wings, uh, along with Pennsylvania research, suggested that the females would be the ones to mostly fashion small stick nests uh, in right around the month of May, early to mid-May, in uh, parts of Pennsylvania and the Northeast. So we knew when to look, we knew kind of where to look. They're often placed in the upper half or upper third of the tree, uh, in hardwood trees or conifer trees. So you couldn't even really rule out one type of forest. Um, they're fairly habitat generalists is what we found from the research. Um, they're often supported by a little bit of a basket. The nests are supported by several upright branches that would, that would hold it together, or sometimes fashioned right against the trunk of a tree with some lateral branches. You'll see there's a nest up here in that photo, up in a, a big northern red oak. Um, and these birds are just good at hiding from us, is what we found. Um, hawks are secret, secretive around their nests and keenly aware of our presence as we present a, a threat to them as a potential predator, uh, as we are a two-legged mammal. Um, and uh, the fact remained for me, realizing that this was a challenge, I had never stumbled across a broad-winged nest by accident, um, being a, a long-time outdoors person and uh, an avid birder. Um, without really looking for a nest, I've never just found a nest by accident. So this, this was not gonna be easy. Um, Pennsylvania research, by the way, did suggest that they, they nested 82% of the time in very heavily forested areas. Uh, they, they preferred a higher conifer component and also a higher wetland component in the proximity of their nests. Uh, nest site fidelity was high, meaning these birds would return to the same general nesting areas, but usually year to year they would build a different nest. Um, and occasionally they would reuse a nest that was made by another raptor or potentially a crow. Um, their breeding range it covers quite a large area, about 700 acres or 283 hectares. So we had a little bit of a false start in 2020 when we were uh, attempting to be 
part of this project with Hawk Mountain. Um, the pandemic delayed the project as a lot of things got delayed that year. And uh, several of us though had an opportunity to look right in our own backyards and uh, in the areas around where we lived uh, and practice nest, nest searching. So a group of volunteers was in touch over Zoom looking for, looking for nests and just doing it fairly casually when we had time. Uh, I, was, I was a lucky person who, uh, who got to find a nest that year. Uh, I stumbled across one in my backyard. Um, I, I was actually looking at that point. I was really trying to find this bird that I was honing in on. And, uh, and a few of us uh, in the Hancock area found nests that year. And um, those nest observations helped inform what we would look for the following year and also give us a better idea of the breeding season timing, which would be the nest construction dates, incubation period, and the fledging dates, ultimately. Um, we found that uh, through the Pennsylvania research that had been done the previous five years, uh, the prey base was, uh, was consisted mostly of small mammals that were being brought to nests about 40% of the time. Uh, it would be small mammal deliveries that were being brought to the nests. 20% uh, that, uh, that was birds. A lot of nestling robins. Uh, I watched this in my own backyard as a robin nest right next to the house got plucked and uh, the robins were taken off to the nest. So that helped me hone in on where that, that nest was. Uh, also, the broadwings would feed reptiles and amphibians to young. Um, I watched a bat being taken to the nest one time. That was really interesting, right at the end of the day once. Um, so it, it kind of corresponded with, uh, with what was being seen in the Pennsylvania study. So we had some idea of what they were feeding on. Um, so we, um, we assembled a team uh, with pandemic precautions in place in 2021. We got underway and uh, in April, uh, as the Broadwings were pouring back into the region, we put together a team of volunteers, about 15 people initially. Uh, we organized a couple of trainings, went out in the field, kind of gave people an idea of what we thought we should be looking for. Still being fairly green about how to do this the right way. Um, but finding those needles in the haystack was the primary goal because our goal was getting transmitters on these birds ultimately. So we needed a whole bunch of nests to work with. Uh, so we went out on Harris Center conserved lands mostly, uh, which is about um, six or 7,000 acres of ownership in Hancock and surrounding eight towns. Um, and over the breeding season that year, we ended up finding eight nests uh, collectively. Um, the following year, we found another seven. So we had 15 nests total, uh, and 45 volunteers ultimately got involved in this project. And at the end of the nesting season, watching these birds throughout the month of, you know, late, late months of May and into most of June, uh, we were watching them deliver food and, and watching the young grow. Uh, but after that, we did take tree and nest measurements just to compare uh, the data there to what was already known about the birds. And we found that um, there was a preference, a strong preference for white pine. Um, we do have a lot of white pine in the Monadnock region, especially in, in certain lower elevation areas. So that may have influenced where these generalists nested. But 53% of the time, white pine was the choice, followed by red oak, red maple, and in one case, an eastern hemlock. Uh, this was an intriguing observation as it, uh, it was very little known in the literature before that, that Broadwings would use hemlocks for a nest. Um, it seemed like this hemlock tree, which was located on Harris Center land, um, was browsed by a porcupine and created uh, a resulting basket type uh, support at the top of the tree for, for the nest uh, to be attached. Um, so that was uh, something we'd only found in the literature a couple of times and rare in Pennsylvania. Also the nest height, we measured uh, nest trees and nest height, and with a sample size of eight, we found that um, Broadwings were selecting spots about 20 meters high compared to what was, what was seen in Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm not sure if it was just, you know, tree height was different in, in those forests, but our birds were nesting higher than they did in Pennsylvania. And we got a better idea of the timetable of, uh, of the breeding season in the Monadnock region. Uh, in two years, looking at uh, all 15 nests, we found that the incubation start time was generally in 
mid, mid-May, sometimes as late as early June. Uh, nestlings would be, would be born by mid-June and sometimes as late as uh, July 7th. And then fledging, uh, when the birds leave the nest. This was mostly in mid-July, in some cases all the way out into early August. Um, overall, uh, a little over one fledgling per nest, 1.33 per nest. Um, in one case, we did have a nest with four uh, fledgling broadwings. That was pretty exciting to see four little fluff balls all growing in the same little nest, getting bigger and bigger. And then uh, a little anecdote that I'll share here was um, uh, it's funny how sometimes you find out about uh, what's going on in your neighborhood. Um, Facebook. <laughs> this was a, a Facebook post was shared with me by a Harris Center board member um, about uh, a, a bird that was diving, this bird on the left here, that was diving at hikers at the Dublin School's Nordic Center. Uh, this was not Nordic season, this was uh, hiking season, so people were walking by and, and routinely getting dive-bombed, and in some cases, you know, in, in a way that was so aggressive that somebody felt it necessary to warn other hikers through social media that this was going on. So, um, so I got wind of this, it was mid-June uh, of this past year, and that was super exciting to me because that means, you know, even though this is a, a rare observation with a broadwing talk, uh, no doubt that means they have young near a nest really close to that area. Uh, so I, I got my hard hat on, and I carried a scope over my shoulder, and uh, started walking those trails, hoping I would get dive-bombed too. And it didn't take too long before the male initially buzzed me, uh, just came out of nowhere and just blasted right past my face, uh, and then proceeded to do it several more times, and then even the female got off the nest, wherever that nest was. Um, it took me about six hours and two visits, and I went back the next day. Um, I ran into a walker on the road. She noticed what I had in my hand and on my head, and I, I guess we started talking, and uh, it turns out this woman had been attacked by these very hawks on the road on her daily walk, and, uh, and that helped me hone in on this area. She actually got hit in the head, uh, so I knew she had to be really close to the nest, and it, it drew blood. <laughs> so. This was um, this this fierce observation led me to the nest, which was located really close to the road. Actually, um, not too surprisingly, I guess. Uh, but these birds would just sit up there in the tree, screaming at you if you were too close. In some cases, um, not typical for the species. Again, that's more typical of a northern goshawk, which behaves that way. But in this case, it ended well. Um, so the trapping process itself uh, occurred in the last week of June, both field seasons. Um, we, we trapped at a, uh, nest sites and we trapped adult birds. Um, we played great horned owl playbacks and had a robotic great horned owl, set up mist nets, and the trapping team, which was um, the two researchers from Hawk Mountain, Drs. Lori Goodrich and Rebecca McCabe. Uh, we, they were accompanied by Harris Center staff and volunteers, and that was the team. Um, uh, Dr. McCabe would sit in a, a little hunting blind uh, move a remote control to move the owl, its wings would be flailing, its head turns, and the call uh, would, be, would be going on. And uh, as the broad wings were up in the trees, we, we just hoped that these birds would come in, and then it was just a waiting game. Ultimately, about half the time or so, uh, these birds did fly in, and less than half the time we did catch a female, which was the target bird because of the size of the transmitters, and I'll talk about that next. So we, we needed this large sample size to start with in order to get our goal of three birds per year. Ultimately, we did catch five birds total and put transmitters on, on five adults, uh, four females and one male. And um, we outfitted these birds with both cellular or either cellular or satellite transmitters, depending on the bird. Um, three in 2021 and two in 2024, uh, 2022, sorry. And as of this October, um, Four birds are still transmitting, we're still transmitting, and we hope are still holding their, their uh, transmitters. Um, the other three, let's see, we caught three males in addition and put color leg bands on them for visual identification purposes. Uh, this is a little bit of the trapping process. In addition to the banding and putting the transmitters on the birds, we took wing and bill measurements, weight of the bird, feather samples, 
and check for parasites. The transmitters themselves, two different types of transmitters were used. Argos satellite units, like the one pictured here, uh, which is not as precise. It has up to a 1500 meter accuracy uh, or error, uh, and it transmits data less frequently. The newer GPS GSM cellular units were the ones that we were putting more stock in. They transmit more frequently, they give us more points, a lot more um, accurate. These units had to be um, nine grams or less, which is less than 3% of the female's body weight in order to, um, to do no negative harm. And they were attached on the back with Teflon ribbons. Um, so this is uh, Dr. McCabe holding the bird. And then we got some really cool maps. I'll, I'll try to fly through these. Um, these are two birds we called Manadnock and Harris in Dublin, New Hampshire. Um, Manadnock, the male on the right, did a lot more moving around during the breeding season. Uh, because males will go out and, and catch a lot of food. Females will sit a lot closer to the nests, their eggs and the young. Uh, so the bird on the left was the female. And uh, we noticed that uh, pre-migratory movements um, were one of the interesting takeaways here. Birds moved between 200 and 500 kilometers north of their breeding range at the end of the season. Uh, females did this only. And then we got really cool migration maps that we got to watch the birds go down the Appalachians and all the way to South America. Um, so three of our birds, uh, two wintered in Colombia the first year and one all the way into central Brazil, giving us a lot of information about the birds. Uh, the timetable of migration became more clear. Uh, when they arrived at the wintering grounds, how long it would take them, differences between the adults and the, the young. In, uh, in the timing and in how far they went. Um, this was Thelma here sitting on a nest. This bird did not show sight fidelity. She nested 13 miles away from her 2021 nest this year. And um, I'll just skip through this one for now and uh, mention that uh, even in the winter, these two that nested close to each other in Dublin are also spending the winters about 30 kilometers apart in Colombia. So that's, uh, that's just interesting to find um, that these birds are concentrated so closely. And future project goals would include um, continuing to monitor the nesting success and the survivorship, quantifying the habitat use, and um, looking at um, habitat variables in relation to development and potential predation pressure. And I'll just mention there's one more opportunity to learn more about this project in greater depth on Tuesday when Dr. McCabe is speaking uh, through Zoom uh, for the Harris Center. Uh, so check out one of our newsletters to find out how to look at that. So uh, I just wanted to acknowledge all the donors, uh, the volunteers who helped with this project, and um, our Hawk Mountain team. And now I can take any questions. Sorry I went over for a couple minutes. Thanks, Phil. Questions for Phil? So the question was for the for the nest where there was four fledglings, did they all survive or did some get, get the boot? As best as I can determine, those four fledglings made it out of the nest. Um, they all got enough food and, and made it, but love to know what happens after that. We, we did not band any young or put transmitters on them. The question is, why do the females travel north before they make their, their south migration? Yeah, it's a great question. We'd love to know why, and we hope that with a greater sample size, some of that will become more clear. Um, there are two leading theories on that. Uh, one is that in, at that time of the year, there's a lot of southwest wind, prevailing winds might just carry these birds away once they're done with their duties feeding their young. Uh, the other thought is that um, these birds are moving out of their, the space where they raised young to give the competitive advantage to their young to find food. This is another thought because they need more help along the way and the adults have the experience to catch food. Um, so not really sure which is, which is uh, you know, there might be another explanation out there, but we haven't figured out why. Maybe one more question if we have one. 
over on this oh. side. Okay. <laughs> so the question was, how dangerous is that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, they can be feisty if you get them, you know, in, in, the, in a certain grip, um, but usually they're pretty docile once you get them with, you know, firmly held by, by the feet, um, getting those talons and beak away from your face. Um, so we didn't use gloves typically. Um, the mask, I'll just mention, the mask was used to reduce any spread of, um, of avian flu from bird to bird. That's why we wore masks this past year. Anybody handling the birds had to do that. Was there one more on the side, or? I think there was one. Well, this will be the last question. Wendy, yeah. go ahead. I believe, oh, oh, go ahead. The question was about the feather samples, if they're checking toxicity of the birds. I believe that's what the Hawk Mountain researchers were taking them for, looking for mercury and other, other contaminants and, and other uh, minerals, maybe. But um, all of that and more. It's going to be in the presentation on Tuesday, so I hope you guys tune in for that. And thank you for your time today.